from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sunil Iyengar, and I'm from the National Endowment for the Arts, where I direct the Office of Research and Analysis. And today, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our next reader, the poet Linda Paston. When I mention words like research and analysis in my job title, I imagine some of you might be thinking, what can those concepts possibly have to do with poetry or with the work of a poet like Linda Paston? Well, like most of you, I'm here simply because I love poetry and admire outstanding poets such as the one you're about to hear. But I want to touch on why the career of Linda Paston in particular has been exemplary for those of us occupied with empirical studies and analytical reasoning, no less than literature and the arts. Poetry lovers who live in the Washington, D.C. area are, feel privileged to know that Paston is a resident of nearby Maryland, where she has served as the state's poet laureate in addition to earning many national honors in the course of 40 years as a published poet. Two separate compilations of her selected poems have been finalists for National Book Awards. Paston has taught at Bread Loaf Writers Conference for two decades, and in my view at least, it's not difficult to spot her influence on a generation of lyric poets. But influence does not describe the subtle working of Paston's effects on readers. I prefer to think of those effects in terms of the title of her most recent collection, Traveling Light. I like the title's double meaning. Not only do you get from it the spare, unencumbered presentation of images, ideas, and language that her readers have grown to expect, but you also think of her poetry as the passage of light on the page. Indeed, a traveling light that brings emotional and sensual clarity to achieve acute aphoristic statements about aging, memory, grief, natural beauty, often horticultural, uh, art, and what she calls in one poem, the myth of perfectibility. This is the aspect of her work that can resonate with an analytical mind, and it's striking to note that her husband is a world-renowned research investigator and a miniaturist of another type, uh, a chief molecular biologist at the National Cancer In Institute nearby. But finally, with traveling light, there's also a lightness of touch that I think goes underappreciated. There's a confiding intimacy, a grace note of humor that attends even her darkest poems. The compact precision of her lyrics might recall to many the poetry of someone like A.E. Hausman, even if she does not write in such strict metrical forms. So in introducing Linda Paston, let me conclude by quoting her poem on that poet, the poem Misreading Hausman, where she writes about weather similar to the one we're now experiencing, I wrote this this morning, so it's getting looks a little better now, actually. Whether trying to become more than merely scenery, this is her words, trying, whether trying to become more than merely scenery, and though today it is telling us something we don't want to hear, it is all so unpredictable, so out of control, that we might as well be children again. Please welcome Linda Paston to the podium. It's very nice to be here. I was at the first book festival and read on September 8, 2011, three days before everything changed for everybody. Um, our instructions were not just to read, but to give you insights about our perspective on life and writing, but that's what my poems do. So I'm mostly going to read today. Um, and I'm going to read from my new book, Traveling Light. But I'm going to start with um, two older poems that perhaps do what they really want me to do, give some perspective on the writing life. And um, the first one describes what my daily life is like going into the study and confronting the blank page. And it's also an autumn poem, if I can find it. The way the leaves keep falling. It is November and morning, time to get to work. I feel the little whip of my conscience flick as I stand at the window watching the great harvest of leaves. Across the street, my neighbor, his leaf blower already roaring, tries to make order from the chaos of fading color. He seems brave and a bit foolish. It is almost tidal, the way the leaves keep falling, wave after wave to earth. 
in Eden, there were no seasons. And sometimes I think it was the tidiness of that garden Eve hated, all the wooden tags with the new names of plants and trees. Still, I am Adam's child too, and I like order, though the margins of my poems are ragged, and I stand here all morning watching the leaves. And another old poem that gives some insight into the writing process. Um, I'm often asked, um, do any of your poems fail? And, and what do you do if you don't like them? And what I did before the computer was just to cut out the few lines of a failed poem that I liked and um, put those lines in a drawer for later. Poets are, are very stingy. I couldn't possibly throw a good line away. And then one day when I just couldn't think of anything to write about, I opened up the drawer and I took out a whole pile of these and I made one poem out of them. And because we're also supposed to be personal today, this poem is in quite a literal sense a short autobiography as well as um, a method of writing. And it's called Threads to be Woven Later. My grandmother's grave like a loaf of newly risen bread. My father's photograph dying in its frame. My mother, whose perfect beauty I finally forgive. Shades at the window, constellations of dust, the tree of veins, a leaf of my own blood. Loving, being loved, the panicking of the pulse the weight of the baby's head, fragile as a moon. A story in my son's writing, the mother is the villain. The year I took to my typewriter as others take to their bed. Words leaking their meanings, ruining the page. The smell of the sea rising, the rising of bread. I bumped the button. <laughs> because we're on the mall, surrounded by monuments, I'm going to read a poem to start called On the Steps of the Jefferson Memorial. We invent our gods the way the Greeks did, in our own image, but magnified. Athena, the very mother of wisdom, squabbled with Poseidon like any human sibling until their furious tempers made the sea writhe. Zeus wore a crown of lightning bolts one minute, a cloak of feathers the next, as driven by earthy lust, he prepared to swoop down on Leda. Despite their power, Frailty ran through them like the darker veins in the marble of these temples we call monuments. Looking at Jefferson now, I think of the language he left for us to live by. I think of the slave in the kitchen downstairs. The first poem in my book is called The Burglary. They stole my mother's silver, melting it down perhaps into pure mineral, worth only its own weight. We must eat with our hands now, grab for food in this new place of greed, our table set only with memories tarnishing even as we speak. My mother holding a shining ladle in her hand, serving the broth to children who will forget to polish her silver, forget even to lock the house. While forks and spoons are divided from all purpose, 
patterns are lost like freezes after centuries of rain, and every knife is robbed of its cutting edge. Um, I come from a food-obsessed family, um, and I have quite a number of, of food poems here and there. This one is called Bread, and I have to say that my second book was called The Five Stages of Grief, after Kublai Khan's stages. Bread. It seems to be the five stages of yeast, not grief you like to write about, my son says, meaning that bread is always rising and falling, being broken and eaten in my poems. And though he is only half serious, I want to say to him, bread rising in the bowl is like breath rising in the body. Or if you knead the dough with perfect tenderness, it's like gently kneading flesh when you make love. Baguette, pita, pane, hala, naan. Bread is the universal language translatable on the famished tongue. Now it is time to open the package of yeast and moisten it with water, watching for its fizz, its blind energy, proofing, it's called, the animate proof of life. Everything is ready, salt, flour, oil, breadcrumbs are what lead the children home. The, the first poem I read had me as Eve in, in the garden, and I am kind of obsessed with Eve. She runs through all of my books, and this is um, a very short Eve poem called Pastoral. Every garden dreams of being eaten, rose bushes or wildflowers, it hardly matters as long as the hum of bees remains peaceable and the door to the grave stays hidden beneath a swath of grass. In the cooling afternoon, each flower relaxes on its pedestal of stem, and the gardener, too, dreams under a tree weighted each fall with apples. And I used to obsessively write food poems, and I finally wrote a poem called The Last Food Poem, thinking that that might stop me, though it didn't. And I tried the same strategy with Eve, and the next poem I'm going to read is called Eve on Her Deathbed. In the end, we are no more than our own stories. Mine, a few brief passages in the book, no further trace of plot or dialogue. But I once had a lover no one noticed as he slipped through the pages, through the lists of those begotten and begetting. Does he remember our faltering younger selves, the pleasures we took while Adam, a good bureaucrat, busied himself with naming things, even after Eden. What scraps will our children remember of us to whom our story is simple and they themselves the heroes of it? I woke that first day with Adam for company, and the tangled path I would soon follow I've tried to forget. The animals stunned at first in the forest the terrible beating wings of the angel, the livid curse of childbirth to come. And then the children themselves loving at times, at times unmerciful. Because of me, there is just one narrative for everyone, one indelible line from birth to death with pain or lust, with even love or murder, only brief diversions, subplots. 
but what I think of now in the final bitterness of age is the way the garden groomed itself in the succulent air of summer, each flower the essence of its own color, the way even the serpent knew it had a part it had to play if there were to be a story at all. Um, my husband and I were going to um, a, a party where we were going to meet a writer whose um, work we admired very much. And when we met him, we didn't like the writer very much. And somebody said then <clears throat> to us that just because you like the milk doesn't mean you have to meet the cow. And I took that quite literally. And this poem is called Cows. You're always mentioning cows, how they're sorrowful or stodgy or simply ruminative, how just because you like milk is not a reason to meet one, though I wouldn't mind, particularly on a nice day in a meadow. And I'd like to meet that author, too, whose books I like, though he is the one you're really talking about, not cows at all. When I was 12, I tried to milk a cow, but though I tugged and tugged, no milk would come. That cow had teats like rows of rubber gloves, big eyes, a wicked tail, and I thought of her when I nursed my first child. Now, here we are in the car driving west past painted barns and horses, and yes, past cows, and our children have grown beyond milk, and I often feel like a cow myself, part stodgy, part sorrowful, and much too ruminative. <laughs> Insomnia. I remember when my body was a friend, when sleep like a good dog came when summoned. The door to the future had not started to shut and lying on my back between cold cheeks did not feel like a rehearsal. Now what light is left comes up, a stain in the east, and sleep, reluctant as a busy doctor, gives me a little of its time. We are going to have a, a question session afterwards, so it's a little bit dangerous to read the next poem. It'll make people nervous about asking questions. Um, those of you who teach creative writing or have taken any courses know that when you come up to the teacher who really didn't like your poem at all and thought it didn't make sense and, and the student said, but that really happened. And you have to say to the student, it doesn't matter if it really happened. But I have to tell you that this really happened. <clears throat> Q&A. I thought I couldn't be surprised do you write on a computer, someone asked. And who are your favorite poets? And how much do you revise? But when the very young woman in the fourth row lifted her hand and without irony inquired, did you write your Emily Dickinson poem because you like her work, or did you know her personally? <laughs> I entered another territory. <laughs> Do I really look that old? I wanted to reply, or don't they teach you anything? Or what did you just say? The laughter that engulfed the room was partly nervous, partly simple hilarity. I won't forget that little school tucked in a lovely pocket of the South 
or that girl whose face was slowly reddening. Surprise, like love, can catch our better selves unawares. I visited her house, I said. I may have met her in my dreams. couple of autumn poems, late September song. With the sound of a freight train rushing through the trees, the first strong wind of autumn makes each leaf sing the song of its own execution. in the forest. The trees are lit from within like Sabbath candles before they are snuffed out. Autumn is such a Jewish season, the whole minor key of it. Hear how the wind trembles through the branches, vibrato as notes of cello music. Notice the tarnished coppers and browns, the piles of leaves just waiting for burning. Though birds are no longer in hiding, though children in bright scarves are kicking the leaves, I smell the smoke and remember winter. Praise what is left. Sunil mentioned that I, I didn't often write in rhyme on meter, but um, I think I'm going to read you a, a rhyme poem just as a break. I do love form. I just don't use it very often. This is called Bronze Bells of Autumn. Although I've made a kind of peace with those I loved who are already dead, Bronze bells of autumn in their minor key toll for the losses still ahead. The weather tells a narrative of change. The wind prepares a path the geese will take. The frost is beautiful, and yet it chills. The harvest moon drowns in the lake. I love the dark. It moves so gradually, but love still more all it will erase, these swarming leaves, this pungent, smoky air, the youth you were, your aging face. Three more poems and then I'll take questions. I have been accused um, by some ornery critics of writing about two ordinary domestic subjects. Um, and so my answer is this poem called The Ordinary. It may happen on a day of ordinary weather, the usual assembled flowers or fallen leaves disheveling the grass. You may be feeding the dog or sipping a cup of tea, and then the telegram or the phone call or the sharp pain traveling the length of your left arm or his. And as your life is switched to a different track, the landscape through grimy windows almost the same, though entirely different. You wonder why the wind doesn't rage and blow as it does so convincingly in Lear, for instance. It is pathetic fallacy you long for, the roses nothing but their thorns, the downed leaves subjects for a body count. And as you lie in bed like an effigy of yourself, it is the ordinary that comes to save you, the china teacup waiting to be washed, the old dog whining to go out. This is my title poem, Traveling Light. 
Um, and my, my beautiful cover, which is a real suitcase on a bed, was found by my daughter-in-law, Amy, who is a wonderful photography editor, and who I thank, <laughs> Traveling Light. I'm only leaving you for a handful of days, but it feels as though I'll be gone forever, the way the door closes behind me with such solidity, the way my suitcase carries everything I'd need for an eternity of traveling light. I left my hotel number on your desk, instructions about the dog and heating dinner. But like the weather front they warn is on its way with its switchblades of wind and ice, our lives have minds of their own. And I'm, I'm going to end um, with another Garden of Eden poem. Um, this one is also in a form, though unrhymed, is something called the Pantoum, which is based on the repetition of lines in a certain order. So you'll hear each line twice. Um, it's the closest I may come to an overtly political poem, though I hope all my poems are in some sense political. Years after the garden. Years after the garden closed on Adam, a thousand, thousand gardens take its place. Hold my hand, I hear the waters rising. Roses, lemons, lilacs, hemlocks, grapes. A thousand, thousand gardens take its place. Is each an Eden waiting to be lost? Roses, lemons, lilacs, hemlock, grapes. What was God thinking when he made the apple? Is each an Eden waiting to be lost? Seeds of knowledge, carelessness, and greed. What was God thinking when he made the apple? Did he do it only for the story? Seeds of knowledge, carelessness, and greed. They say the ice cap is already melting. Did he do it only for the story? Meringues of childhood melted on the tongue. They say the ice cap is already melting. The angel still waits with his flaming sword. Meringues of childhood melted on the tongue, but innocence alone will never save us. The angel still waits with his flaming sword. Flowers and vegetables, forests tremble. Innocence alone will never save us. How beautiful the world is in the morning. Flowers and vegetables, forests tremble. How beautiful the world is in the morning. Years ago, the garden closed on Adam. Hold my hand, I hear the waters rising. questions on anything about the poems you've heard, about writing in general, anything but Emily Dickinson. <laughs> so. Hi. Am I on? I don't, I don't try again. I was recently at the University of Maryland in the art gallery uh, seeing the work of a wonderful artist um, named Chow, and there I came upon about 10 drawings or with your poems in them. And I assume that she did all the line work. But could you say something about the collaboration? Because they're up there as a collaboration. Right, and right. And they were just absolutely wonderful. Yeah, they didn't have a yeah. chance to get over there. Well, I got a, um, a phone call from um, the director of the little museum at the University of Maryland saying that they were having five or six poets each contribute a poem, and an artist would do a rendition of it. And being naive, I assumed that the artist was going to be a student. And I said, sure, though I don't own the rights to my poems, Norton does. And she did a, a wonderful, wonderful um, drawing of, of my poem, Why Are Your Poems So Dark? And then the director said, 
they'd like to do a chapbook of six or eight of my poems with her illustrating each one. And this time I got permission <laughs> from Norton. Um, it's very complicated. It's my poem, but I had to go through hoops to get them to agree to it. So there will actually be a little chapbook of those poems and those drawings. Uh, I don't, it won't be for sale because then the permissions got too complicated, but I'm gonna get a couple of copies and I haven't seen the, the pictures yet. Did you collaborate with her though? I mean, she no, 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 I never met her. She just took the poems and, and yeah. Um, this is delightful. I've been a fan of yours for about 30 years and I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. I have a, a two part question. One is um, what poets have influenced you Well, I, I, I always think that it's up to the, the critics to say who influenced you. I know what poets I love, um, but I can't say they influenced me. I mean, for example, I really, when I started to write, I was deeply into T.S. Eliot. I went around quoting him. You can't see much of T.S. Eliot in my work, so I don't know about, about influence. Um, a, a review of a book of mine said that they liked the book, but it was much too influenced by the poet Adelaide Crapsey. And I had never heard of Adelaide Crapsey. <laughs> and it's such a strange name that I thought this must be an insult in, in some way. And then I, I looked her up and she really was a poet. And she was influenced by Emily Dickinson. So maybe, you know, maybe I was, right. And what was the second part of the question? Before I started being what I consider a serious poet, I, I wrote a failed novel. Um, I was right out of college, and I took it out of years later and looked at it, but th its main um, theme was the problems of chastity, and since that doesn't seem to be a problem anymore, I figured it was too dated to do anything with. But no, I mostly just write poetry. Thank you. I am, I think she's quite wonderful. I, I'm glad that she popped in your mind when you were listening to me. I consider that a great compliment. Yeah. I'd like to repeat what the previous speaker of what she has said, that your poetry is such an astute and wonderful observation of human nature. Thank you. But I have a specific poem. You referenced the five stages of grief. And I just wondered if there was a personal loss or where that poem Well, it was about a loss that, that wasn't a death, actually. Um, quite complicated, but I write so many poems about loss and mourning, and they're, they're more general than specific, though some of them grew out of very specific things. But that, that particular poem um, is often used by grief counselors, which which I really appreciate that, that it's done some, some good out in the world, possibly. Um, but there wasn't a particular death that I was thinking of, though I had lost people that I cared very much about. Okay. The sign said that I have 10 minutes left for questions, so a couple more questions, or maybe I'll read one or two more poems, if you don't have any. Is this somebody walking to a question? or just leaving. Yeah. Okay, well maybe I'll end then by reading The Five Stages of Grief, which I don't usually read simply because it's longish, but I have 10 minutes, so why not? I really rarely read this out loud. The Five Stages of Grief. The night I lost you Someone pointed me toward the five stages of grief. Go that way, they said, it's easy, like learning to climb stairs after the amputation. And so I climbed. Denial was first. I sat down at breakfast, carefully setting the table for two. I passed you the toast 
You sat there. I passed you the paper. You hid behind it. Anger seemed more familiar. I burned the toast, snatched the paper, and read the headlines myself. But they mentioned your departure, and so I moved on to bargaining. What could I exchange for you? The silence after storms, my typing fingers. Before I could decide, depression came puffing up, a poor relation, its suitcase tied together with string. In the suitcase were bandages for the eyes and bottles of sleep. I slid all the way down the stairs, feeling nothing, and all the time hope flashed on and off in defective neon. Hope was my uncle's middle name. He died of it. After a year, I am still climbing, though my feet slip on your stone face. The tree line has long since disappeared. Green is a color I have forgotten. But now I see what I am climbing towards, acceptance, written in capital letters, a special headline, acceptance, its name is in light. I struggle on, waving and shouting. Below, my whole life spreads its surf, all the landscapes I've ever known or dreamed of. Below, a fish jumps, the pulse in your neck. Acceptance. I finally reach it, but something is wrong. Grief is a circular staircase. I have lost you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.